What about Vietnam? A podcast with Gary Newsom. The series where Gary talks with travelers about their experiences and adventures. Find out more about Vietnam from the people who have actually been there. What about Vietnam? Whether it's adventure, exploring the culture and cuisine, shopping, or just soaking up the sun. Let Carrie and her travellers pave the way for a magical holiday in Vietnam. What about Vietnam? Xin chào and welcome to What About Vietnam. One of the topics that doesn't get covered very much uh, about Vietnam is art. And it really should because it is one of the experiences you're going to get to have when you come to visit Vietnam. Art in Vietnam is everywhere. And as you're going to hear in this program, there are lots of expressions of art and it has evolved over time. And we're going to really take it back 100 years and really talk about just how Vietnam has developed uh, in the art, art world. I'm joined today with Bridget March. She is a prolific artist herself. She uh, originally uh, trained as a freelance product designer. She became a a senior lecturer at Lee's University of Art and moved to Saigon in 2012. And that was really to fulfill a lifelong ambition to be a full-time artist. She was inspired to stay and She went on to then produce three books about Hoi An, Sapa and Saigon, and those books include some of her art and her sketches. She has uh, had seven solo exhibitions of paintings and drawings in Vietnam uh, galleries and international hotels. She's also gone on to curate the fabulous art space at Anantara Hoi An Resort in Hoi An. She has her own gallery and she's very much about supporting local artists uh, in their endeavours and their journey. She gives up the best galleries that you have to see and go to in Vietnam. So that's going to be in your show notes uh, on our website, What About Vietnam. Dot com. You can make arrangements to go to her gallery uh, when you visit Hoi An and those details will also be included in the show notes and the transcript. So make sure you check that out. We're in for a great show and I think we're going to learn a lot about art and certainly I hope it's going to give you a greater appreciation of it in Vietnam. Let's uh, welcome Bridget March to the program. Good morning, Bridget March. Welcome to What About Vietnam? Good morning, Kerry. It's very nice to be here. It's been a it's been a while in the baking, hasn't it? I'm so delighted to have you on the show. But you know, it's two years into COVID, here we are, and I've finally got you on the show. So I'm very, very excited. We're going to be talking art today. And I think for people who are coming to Vietnam and get the chance to see some art in Vietnam, I think it would be really handy for them to know what they're looking at, what they're seeing, and maybe some background. So I'm going to ask you, Bridget, if we can start just talking about a little bit of history uh, of art in Vietnam and, you know, just what people can expect to see when they come. Sure. I remember when I first came to Vietnam 13 years ago, I was lucky enough to go to the Hanoi Museum of Art. And in fact, that's where I fell in love with Vietnam because it's chronologically organized. And I felt I was seeing the whole story of Vietnam in pictures. And some of it wasn't easy to understand because it's so different from Western art. So some of the landscapes are a bit strange But in fact, they are um, representational. Mountains are about reaching to heaven. Uh, Rivers are about pathways in your life. And you'll always see that the people within these landscapes are tiny, really tiny. And that's because it represents man's very small place 
in the universe. So they're very different and they're quite magical. And a Vietnamese, an Asian person, can stare at one of these paintings for a long time, for an hour, and actually meditate about these things. Very different from Western art. And I think, you know, that is really worth mentioning because there is aspects of religion in that, philosophy of hope, uh, aspirational aspects. And sometimes as a Westerner, we come in, we blow into the country, we get off the bus or whatever, and we're thrown on a tour. And then somebody says, we're going to this gallery. We walk in and we see these pictures and it, I'm the same. It would have been really handy for someone to just give me some context. And I think those words that you've just shared with us now helps a lot. Can we can we go into the actual art forms, I guess, as in lacquer art, silk paintings, things like that? Can you talk to us about that? Sure. So the traditional art forms in this part of Asia uh, starts with ink, black ink, which is used in landscape painting, these representational landscape paintings, and calligraphy. And the calligraphy here is very much the same as it is in the Arab nations, where the calligraphy is also a meditation. It's not necessarily that you um, think it's beautiful, but you meditate on the words or the meanings, and they're like meditations in your day remind us to be good and thoughtful and all that sort of stuff. Then there is um, lacquer art. And the lacquer comes from spindly little trees. It's collected in very much the same way as rubber. So the trees are scored and the lacquer drips out. Um, The lacquer in each nation depends on its climate, just like wine. Um, And in Japan or Korea, the trees are a bit fatter and the lacquer flows more freely. The trees in Vietnam are really skinny and they actually collect the lacquer in seashells strapped to the stems, the trunks of the trees. And so little comes off. And it's said by the practitioners that the Vietnamese lacquer is the most difficult to work with. And it's very prized, highly prized. Most lacquer painters in Vietnam are using Japanese, Korean or Chinese lacquer and finding practitioners using Vietnamese lacquer is rare. There are some masters in Hanoi and we actually have a world specialist in that art form living in uh, central Vietnam. Things like watercolour and oil painting did not come until the French arrived. These were imported from Europe. And, you know, in my very limited experience in this, as you well know, uh, I've been gone kind of on a world discovery tour with art in Vietnam. I discovered lacquer art and the basic art work, uh, how shall I say, uh, skill, very late. And uh, to, to, the e- to the end that uh, I actually bought some during COVID in Australia at a ga- gallery that unfortunately had to close. But what I got to see just before then, just before COVID actually, in Saigon was them actually crushing the, the shells, the eggshells, the, the pearl, etc., cetera, to, to raise a different surface to the lacquer art. So there is like you can buy urns and you can buy, you know, beautiful bowls, etc. But the actual paintings or pictures uh, I bought were abstract. But they have these beautiful insets of pearl and and different shells, et cetera. Can you give some explanation of that 
artwork skill and how long it takes to create one of these because I've been told that many layers upon layers, it can take a while. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, um, artists have, uh, in, in you know, hundreds of years ago, had to use the materials that were available to them. And um, the lacquer was the medium which carried the colour. So they would take some yellow clay, mix it with the lacquer to make a nice sort of yellow ochre colour. They would crush beetles to get the red cochineal, the red blood from them, mix it with the lacquer to create a red colour. And other stones would, or powders, earths, would be crushed and mixed with the lacquer. Now, one of the colours that they were not able to produce was white. Um, so they took chickens' eggs, or ducks' eggs, I should say. They took ducks' eggs, because they're so white, and crushed them. And depending on how finely you powder them, you can either create something that looks a bit like crazy paving, so it's textured, or you can crush it very finely to get a kind of powdered finish. But of course, it's calcium. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, it doesn't make a very smooth white. So the white is always slightly textured, and some artists like it to be more textured, larger lumps of shell than others. And they also used mother of pearl because it glitters. And uh, it's been used in many different ways. Sometimes paper is actually coated with the mother of shell, mother of pearl shell, to make it glittery. In lacquer paintings, it tends to be used in quite large chunks um, to decorate precious items in the painting, like a lady's fan or an emperor's hat would be highlighted with mother of pearl or mussel shells, different shells, oyster shells, mussel shells, all give different types of mother of pearl. So this is just using local materials to create the colours you need. The base of the painting is clay. Uh, these days it is the layer of clay is laid down onto plywood Years ago, it would have been onto a, a stable, dry hardwood. And you take a, um, about a three millimeter layer of clay to get a smooth surface onto which you can apply your color. When you're using edge shell or mother of pearl, which is quite lumpy, you actually have to carve a small hole in the clay to inlay the egg shell or the mother of pearl so that the surface of the painting is smoother. It's it is really labour intensive. And when you have put all your colours down, you then grind the surface. And depending on how much you grind it, you can reveal colours underneath or leave colours on the surface. And the finer the uh, abrasive that you use to polish the lacquer, the shinier it will be. It can take days to dry the lacquer in between every coat. And it only works in semi-tropical and tropical climates because it dries in humidity, amazingly. So this does not work in a climate like the UK, uh, Northern Europe, it just doesn't work. You have to have humidity to, in inverted commas, dry or uh, cure the lacquer. And as I got to speak to one of the craftsmen in a uh, in a factory in Saigon, as I said back in two thousand and nineteen, uh, and he was. He went to great efforts to explain that layers and how many layers it may require to get the right finish 
that they want to achieve. And sometimes for us, uh, when we're buying lacquer art, we can get the cheaper versions, which have only got maybe, you know, one or two layers. So it comes off very easily versus the the craftsman who has gone to the extra time and effort uh, and labor to increase the layers to increase the the life, I guess, of the, the said item. Is there any truth to that? Totally. Oh, thank so God for that. The, uh, <laughs> the cheapest lacquers, uh, lacquer arts, which are just a few dollars, are not even using lacquer. They're using commercial paint like um, domestic gloss paint. It has nothing to do with lacquer at all. Um, and then there's the mid-range lacquers, where they're using traditional materials, but maybe using the cheaper Korean and Japanese lacquers and only, as you say, using one, two, three layers. The quality of a piece of lacquer work is always reflected in the price. So if you are looking at a work of art, which is over $6,000 You're looking at the real thing. And if it's costing less than that, then you're looking at something that is made from less expensive materials, a quicker process. And at the very lowest level where you're paying $10 for something, these are just mass produced for the tourist market. They call them lacquers, but they're not even lacquers. And, you know, I bring that up because I've often got uh, thrown that line uh, with a with a group where we've talked about lacquer art and they've said, gosh, you know, I saw these ones in um, in this gallery and they wanted, oh, I don't know, it was hundreds of US dollars. And uh, I think I saw the same thing in the markets for about 25. And, you know, I'm I'm hesitant to reply because I, I need to be careful of what I say there. But, um, yes, one is closer to the real thing than the other. Can we talk a little bit more? I, I really want to delve into your history also in Vietnam and, you know, where you're sitting now in Hoi An. But I, I want to kind of expand a little bit more to the other art forms, to, you know, ceramics and pottery and and maybe even to the lanterns and and some of the other art that people can just keep their eyes peeled for because there are some some beautiful aspects to those and I would love people to to know about that. Can we can we throw that into the mix? Yeah you can. I think it's important to define the difference between art and craft. So craft is where something is reproduced again and again. It's handmade. It takes a great deal of skill, but it's reproduced again and again. And you'll see that in the beautiful embroideries that you'll find in the ethnic villages done by the older women. They're really painstaking. And a jacket, a skirt, um, a good quality object will take, you know, two years to make because they grow the uh, they grow the plants that make the fibers, that make the weaving, um, that make the dye, and it's a very, very long process but they're reproducing the same designs generation on generation. And you can identify exactly the village from which somebody comes by the patterns they reproduce. And this is craft. It's a traditional craft. Art, however, is when an artist is producing something original, something conceptual, a new idea, a new design, not just a variation on something that's been done for a long time, like 
lotus blossoms on a vase, but actually something original. So um, I would like really to talk about the artists that produce these things rather than the craft, the crafts that are, are produced. Um, and at the moment, there are actually very few artists working in ceramics. Um, but those who do have their work exhibited all over the world. Um, and uh, at the end of this, um, I would like your listeners to have access to a list of 10 or 15 artists, the kind of work they produce um, and where they might see their work. Um, in Hoi An, there's a lot of traditional crafts. The ceramics, uh, we have a ceramic village. There's woodworking. In amongst the woodworkers, there are artists and there are craftsmen. And some of the artists who are carving things like jackfruit would um, produce the most amazing work. And they can be commissioned. You can actually ask them to do something unique for you, um, and they offer for sale some unique works of art. Alongside that, they're producing highly skilled craft work, which is reproduced and available for sale. The lanterns, um, this is a craft. Um, lanterns are produced all over Asia, and uh, there's a kind of a story that goes with them that it was the fishermen who were creating fish traps using bamboo combined with the tailors who had the silk. They put them together and they were kind of covering fish traps with silk to create lanterns uh, inside which there would be some oil or a candle perhaps. And the lanterns in... Central Vietnam, I can't speak for what's going on in Hanoi and uh, Saigon, but in Central Vietnam, the trend is moving to much more uh, patterned um, lanterns. Uh, they're becoming much, much prettier. And there is some hand painting going on. And again, you can, you can commission somebody to hand paint something for you. Uh, but it's a craft rather than art. That's a great story about the lanterns. My God, I didn't, I didn't know that. That is terrific to, to and and I can I can see that that's feasible. That there, there's some logic to that. Absolutely, uh, Bridget. I want to I want to take you back now to your arrival into Vietnam in 2012 into Saigon. Uh, we've talked about the fact that you you had this as a big wish. Uh, on your list to to come to Saigon to further your own artistic journey, can you talk to us about that? What what was some of the significance of uh, you coming to Vietnam? Uh, reasons, I guess, and also where was Vietnam at in the art sphere or the art world at that time? We're talking Saigon to twelve. No, really, not that long ago, <laughs> although quite a lot has changed in the art world. <laughs> yes, just a bit. Yeah. Anyway, I suffered from the same as many uh, aspiring artists when I was young. It's a bit like, you know, don't let your daughter go on the stage, Mrs. Brown. It's like, don't let your daughter become an artist. Um, don't let your son become a dancer don't let them join a rock band. You know, it's going to end in failure. And I <laughs> I had the It's not a real job. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real job. Real job. No. You're going to starve, you know. Anyway, so I was a – I went to university. I did design, and I was a successful product designer for 20 years. And then I ended up as a senior lecturer – in an independent art school in Northern England. And at the same time, I'm painting, I'm etching, drawing, I'm getting my work into galleries. 
and I really want to give up the day job and be a full-time artist. But the truth is that in the Western world, unless you are independently wealthy or have a wealthy patron, it's really almost impossible to give up the day job because the cost of living is so high. And a, a new artist needs to build up a portfolio of work and it can take, even if you're brilliant and amazing and you have a famous patron and you've got a million dollars, it's still going to take you three or four years to become established. I didn't have that privilege. Anyway, I came to visit a friend in Vietnam and she suggested that I come here and spend a bit of time. And I thought, well, you know, I could take a year out and I could do that. But 10 years later, I'm still here. And I could afford to do it in Vietnam. The cost of living is much lower. And because the art scene was still emerging after years of oppression, the Western artist uh, arriving and doing watercolors and publishing books of sketches and so on, uh, was quite a novelty, and I very quickly had a little bit of success um, enough to establish me. And I was interviewed by TV stations and all kinds of publicity. At that time, Vietnamese artists were still being censored by the culture police. And if they weren't doing kind of portraits and flowers and landscapes, if they were trying to say something a bit more conceptual, then the culture police would land on them and insist that the work was destroyed. I worked in a gallery in Saigon for a short time and was familiar with the activities of other galleries in the city. And it was very regular for exhibitions to be visited by the culture police on the opening night. And they would come in and they would take pieces of work off the wall uh, or insist that they be covered with brown paper because they felt that they were not fit for public consumption or that they offended the government's uh, view of the way Vietnam should be represented. So, for example, uh, there was an exhibition of a young photographer, a Vietnamese photographer, who was doing fabulous photography among some of the older buildings in Saigon. Really great color, contrast, light. Um, but they covered the whole of his exhibition with brown paper because they thought that it represented poverty, and that was not how Saigon wanted the world to perceive it. They didn't know that uh, Westerners coming to the country knew exactly where Saigon was at, that it was at a turning point in its life. It was turning from a third world city into a modern superstar, and this transformation and the remnants of the old city are considered very beautiful by Westerners who are interested in buying photography. So a lot of that kind of thing was going on. My work was considered to be very safe because I was doing nice little watercolours of lovely um, urban and countryside landscapes. And um, I became very popular because of that. And the authorities loved me because I made Vietnam look very beautiful. And I think it's worth mentioning that because, you know, people, when they do get to look at a piece of art, uh, you know, are going to draw certain perceptions uh, about what the story is behind it. Let's face it, good good art to me speaks to you. It it, it has a story, and there's there's something in that. And you're right, Vietnam is very big on making sure that they are seen by the world in a particular way, depending on, as you say, the culture police's perception at the time. 
Uh, I think, you know, there has been an evolution that we are witnessing that Vietnam is becoming a little bit more open about sharing some of their not so good views uh, of their their countryside or their history or their whatever, because, you know, it's about keeping it real also for the rest of the world. I think, you know, uh, history is not always going to look beautiful. It's going to have aspects of of horror and pain and shame and uh, destruction. But that would be every country possibly in the world. So why would Vietnam be any different? Moving on, you and I spoke earlier about the artists and the differences in three main cities being Saigon, Huey and Hanoi. Can you speak to that a little bit more? I found that really interesting. Sure. Um, So prior to the French arriving, artists were just artisans or craftspeople and they would be reproducing beautiful works of art for temples for the homes of the wealthy, for government buildings, and so on. They were not really permitted or encouraged or able to express themselves. Um, It wasn't appropriate for people who created art to have, um, to, to produce conceptual art or something that even identified the artist. Up until 100 years ago, an artist would sign their work with the name of the emperor, not with their own name. So, and there are still some works, um, beautiful works in Hoi An, which are signed this way. For example, in the Cantonese Assembly Hall in the old town, There is the most beautiful, vigorous dragon, which is constructed out of uh, concrete and broken china, a bit like the work that Gaudi does in Barcelona. Same, exactly the same craft. And there's a signature on it, but the signature is the name of the emperor at the time. And we will never, ever know Uh, the artist who developed the idea for this particular dragon. So when the French arrived, they wanted to bring with them some of their Western arts, music, dance, architecture, and they established, gradually, they established um, different schools where people could study this. The teachers initially were French, Uh, They also took some Vietnamese artisans and craftspeople back to France to learn how to use some of the Western materials and to learn from European artists, music, art, fashion, you know, all the different arts, literature, poetry, and so on. And then these Vietnamese came back to Vietnam and were established in schools of art, the very first was in Saigon at um, kind of 1903, something around that date. The next one was in Hanoi. And the third was the most modern, which was, I think, 1957, was in Hue. And each one of these schools developed its own way of interpreting the arts, you know, because of the teachers who were working there. And Hanoi featured very much on technique. And Hanoi is still very well known for copy artists. They are brilliant. They can copy the Mona Lisa almost perfectly. Wow. Because they're so skilled at manipulating the colours and the materials. Um, They're fluent in that language, but they're not. They're They weren't, anyway, so skilled at developing new concepts in art, new messages, new styles. In 
Saigon, they focus more on uh, the technical arts like graphic design, um, architecture, uh, the kind of things that build a modern city. And of course, alongside that came artists and um, a much more modern Western and ultimately Americanized approach to producing art, fashion, design, literature. Hue is kind of somewhere in the middle. And out of the Hue School of Art have come some amazing colorists. The art has a very European feel about it, but it's fresh. It's uniquely Vietnamese in the use of color, the landscapes, the buildings, the interpretation of the environment. Um, and, you know, if you, if you go in and out of enough galleries and you see the names and origins of enough artists, you can begin to see where they came from, which school they studied in, it becomes clearer. Okay, so if I'm coming to Vietnam and I really want to seek out some really uh, some art that you've talked about, the kind of, kinds of work that we've discussed on the show today, where do my guests go? Where do they head? All right, I've got a list. Uh, Excellent. I knew you would, Bridget. <laughs> I have a list. I was counting on that. Yeah. I'll add that. Just, <laughs> just before you say anything, everyone, I want everyone to know that list will feature on the website. Yeah. It'll have a link to the list on the show notes. So whether you listen on iTunes or Spotify or any of those, it'll always direct you back to where you can get that list. So uh, all yours now, Bridget, just so you know that the right. list is going to be there. Okay. I think everybody uh, knows Asia can be really tricky because you can't recognise what's authentic and what is fake. What's Absolutely. a copy and what's the real thing? So it's important to know where to go. And I have a list which offers, which will direct your listeners to the three major public museums of art in Hanoi, in Hue and Saigon. And there's quite an interesting young contemporary art museum in Da Nang that's worth a visit. But in addition to those, in each centre, I'm offering what I know to be the best art galleries. If you're looking for the real thing. Now, look, when you're visiting, when you're traveling, I've done the same. You're not necessarily looking for authentic works of art. You're just looking for something which is going to be a lovely souvenir of your visit. It might be something abstract, it might be a landscape, it might be a portrait, and you'll find those. You can't help. Everywhere you go, you'll trip over those. And local artists usually have their work hanging out on the street outside their studios. Um, it's not hard to find. Um, but even when you go into an artist's studio, you don't really know if the artist is producing original work or whether he's just he or she is actually reproducing the work that his grandfather did or that some famous artist in Hanoi or Saigon produced 100 years ago. You have no idea. So you really need to go to some of the better art galleries and they are in that list. My little gallery in central Vietnam is just about the only place in central Vietnam which properly represents offers a full service for local artists and visitors. My aim in a gallery is to support local artists with the website, videos, uh, interviews. You can come and talk to me about the art. I can arrange visits for you to meet the artists or even spend time with artists if you want to have an experience with them. A, a gallery, a full service gallery like mine, gives you uh, the trust you need to spend a bit more than average on art. And I've listed similar places in Hanoi and Saigon. 
but it's not easy. You need, you need, you need to know you're in the right gallery if you're a collector at least. Yes, and I think that is just such a great point because I don't know how many times I have I've been kind of double checking myself to go, mm, you know, is this the real McCoy or is this just a, a really good coffee shop or whatever? And I hate the fact that Vietnam gets called copy copy. I I think that that really that brand of, you know, that everything is copy, copy. I really want to do everything I can on this show to stamp that out. I'm not saying that there is copy, copy stuff out there, of course, uh, you know, that that's a reality. But to brand it totally that there aren't true artisans out there in Vietnam that are doing the most exquisite art, and guess what? You're not going to get it for a nickel. And no. people have said to me, said to me before, oh, you know, I think Vietnam's get, you know, it could get expensive. And I said, it compared to what? You know, like it's it's interesting that they uh well for a lot of people, there is a I guess a perception that they're always going to get something for a nickel or a dime in Vietnam, that, you know, they wouldn't pay that extra money for that, you know, that beautifully designed dress that's just a one-off piece of art that if you walk into a room, uh, you are going to be a showstopper. You know, there's leather work, there is beautiful ceramics that, you know, yes, they're not nickel and dime stuff. And, you know, I've been to your gallery. I've always loved uh, the work that you do and more so probably the work that you do for artists and to give them that platform because, as you say, it's hard to find and it's hard to find that authenticism. And it's that authenticism that you uh, sell uh, mostly, I think, is the gift uh, to us all. So I'll tell you now my favourite places to visit. Number oh, wow. one has to be the Hanoi Museum of Art. It is large. It's well organised. It's amazing. The, uh, the breadth, the variety of work is amazing. And you really, really learn something about uh, Vietnam without having to read a book or a guidebook. It's all laid out before you in pictures. Uh, it's a storybook. Um, and all the different art forms are there. Lacquer, oil, watercolour, silk painting, uh, ceramics, sculpture, and the collection there covers a period of about 1,500 years. It's really wow. great. It's great. And it's right in the heart of the most interesting part of the city, very close to the famous uh, Temple of Literature. And, you know, see, it's really easy to find. It's very accessible. My second most favorite place is the Museum of Art in Saigon. It's in the most gorgeous building in the middle of town near the Central Market. And again, it's, um, it's, it's arranged slightly differently and it has a more contemporary feel than the Hanoi one. It's more colourful. There is more abstract stuff. There is some of that Russian brutalist stuff. Um, there are bronzes and much more ceramics. Uh, it's a really lovely place to go. And you can actually, it's not, a, it's not as big as the Hanoi Museum. You can do it in about an hour. And my third is absolutely don't miss this one. This is just outside Hue, and it is the Le Badang memory space. And it is new. It has been architect designed. It's in the most beautiful hillside setting the building itself will take your breath away and inside is the story of the life of one Vietnamese artist um, uh, who came originally from a village near Hue 
and the work is fabulous. There's uh, videos to sit and watch. It's an amazing place, and it's got a great cafe and a gorgeous garden setting. So those would be, for me, the three don't miss these. If you're interested in art, don't miss these three. And then if you've got a bit more time, have a look at the list uh, that accompanies this and um, go exploring. Definitely. And I hope to see you, Bridget, in Hoi An later this year. Can't wait to catch up uh, face to face. It's been a while. Thank you again for coming on the show and sharing your insights into art in Vietnam. It has been totally my pleasure. And it's really lovely to see you again, Kerry, after such a long time. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Check out the episode notes for more information. What about Vietnam? Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review and stay tuned for more fun adventures in Vietnam. What about Vietnam?